Okay, thank you. So you, you we can begin the discussion. Uh, maybe Clint, you might want to start uh, the discussion. Danford, uh, uh, Figile is starting us off. Over to okay. you, Figile. Oh, Figile, okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for welcoming us. Um, I'm just going to open with the, with the ritual quickly just to, to acknowledge and invite our guides and our ancestors and ancestresses um, in the way that we you know. So whoever that we identify as our guides and spirits, feel free to invite uh, because we're all beings of the spirit. And that is what has been taken away from us. Thank you, Sis Fidele. Thank you all so much for turning up today for this dialogue that we hope to set up. Um, a very quick comment on the title, Coloniality is not over, it is all over. It's um, a week ago, I joined the webinar with Walter Mignolio, 
who is one of the key decolonial theorists, Latin American decolonial theorists, and he shared with us this idea that was shared with him by one of his students in his classes, that coloniality is not over, it is all over. And of course, today our focus is on decolonizing the humanities. So what we thought we would do is focus on what that means for us from our experiences and the, the, the particular standpoint from which we come. So the second part of the title um, on, on reconstituting the deconstituted in and through the humanities, there's a play on words with deconstituted. Walter Mignolio used the word um, destituted. And so we thought we'd use the word, because he talked about reconstituting the destituted. Uh, we just played with the words deconstituted and destituted, and we'll talk more about that as we engage in the dialogue. So thank you all for being here. Very quickly, uh, you've seen our bios, and as um, Shona indicated, we'll introduce ourselves through the dialogue as we proceed. Just to give you an idea of how we thought about setting up this dialogue, and of course you can't plan a dialogue, you can plan for a dialogue. Clint, um, is from the School of Religion, Philosophy and Ethics. Fikela is from the School of Social Sciences and I'm from the School of uh, Education. And in our discussions, we thought it would be really useful to draw on our experiences of the university in terms of all of the spaces that we occupy. And for us to begin to identify examples or manifestations of coloniality and the ways in which, for example, the humanities continues to perpetuate coloniality. And of course, in terms of an hour, we are very cognizant uh, of the fact that we can't really begin to engage with the theoretical concepts, coloniality, decoloniality, decolonization, but we hope that it will come up in the dialogue and we will share our understandings as a collective. In other words, you also contribute to that. So very quickly, um, this webinar, so sorry, let me say something about the Decoloniality Action Forum this UKZ and Decoloniality Action Forum was formed at the end of the first summer school uh, last year. And we had such an incredible experience and participants at the Decoloniality Summer School, particularly from UKZ, and we had people from all over the country as well as international scholars and students and activists, decided that we really needed to take this forward. We didn't want this to be a one-off event annually. So this was established and really driven by the student activists that were part of the first summer school. Right? Um, so Figuila, Clint and I are a part of that decoloniality action forum. And I think we emphasize the point action because I think it's important for us to theorize our experiences, but more importantly, we knew, need to use that as a basis for moving forward in terms of action, in terms of doing. And here we draw on Paulo Freire's notion of naming, reflecting, and acting. And we'll come back to that. But I quickly want to share a few ideas that hopefully will <clears throat> stimulate a dialogue amongst us. So as part of the UKZ, and I've written this down so that I don't divert, uh, <laughs> don't go off on a tangent, which I'm very famous for doing. As part of the UKZ in Decoloniality Summer School Project, I was in the process of planning the Decoloniality webinar series to sustain the dialogues that we had initiated in the summer school at the beginning of this year. And in doing so, I was collaborating with the core group of teachers that made up the people that uh, 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 worked and taught and learned in the UKZN summer school. My initial thoughts in the first webinar was to facilitate a critical engagement with how universities were responding to the pandemic locally and globally. As with the summer school, we wanted to include voices of communities, voices of people commonly marginalized, both within and outside the academy. The voices of students, staff, social activists, essentially disenfranchised communities within and outside academia. Our key aim was to create spaces for critical dialogues. And here I draw on Paolo Freire's conception of dialogue. Freire, 1970, in his book, A Pedagogy of the Oppressed, explains that, to, and quote, exist, to exist humanly is to name the world, to change it, 
unquote, which, quote, is not the privilege of some, but the right of everyone, unquote. And this can only happen through dialogue, says Freire. Dialogue is an encounter between people who want to name the world. And when we talk about naming the world, we're talking about naming oppression, naming injustice, naming the ways in which dehumanization happens. Name the, uh, to name our oppression in our struggle to transform and humanize the world. Freire reminds us that dialogue is only possible with those who wish to name the world. Those who wish not to name the world, quote, deny others the right to speak their word, unquote, to name their oppression and thereby perpetuate, quote, dehumanizing aggression, unquote. In our discussion around the focus of our first webinar, Nelson Maldonado Torres, one of the teachers at the UK ZND Coloniality Summer School, who interestingly has now been appointed as honorary professor at UKZN. So we're very excited about that. And as you can see, our project is really growing and developing. So in our discussion, he explained, and I quote from the email he sent us, he says, I'm interested in getting to know the analyses coming from people working with communities and not only books and figuring out how to support them. He saw in the, in the pandemic an opportunity for universities to build linkages with communities as authentic partners in the decolonial knowledge project. His colonial question was, how is the current crisis an opportunity to reimagine our work with knowledge creators out of the university? And how can we together build an institution that is more responsive to the effects of modern colonial catastrophe? Nelson further explained intellectual authority and performativity needs to be decolonized, not only by including other knowledge producers in what we do, but by producing knowledge differently. And therein lie many critical ideas, which I hope that we can talk about more. Nelson was saying this, uh, sorry, Nelson was saying, this is an opportunity for us to reimagine a humanizing university. This resonated with my own thinking around working in and with communities to produce, produce knowledges from the standpoint of the oppressed with the oppressed, with a view to developing decolonial, a decolonial pedagogy of the oppressed. And here I'm drawing on Freire's concept. So pursuing the plan to set up this decoloniality webinar series, I went back to some key questions posed by Sabelo and, Sabelo and Lovu Gacheni, another teacher in our decoloniality summer school. Um, from a keynote address that he presented in 2016 titled Decolonizing the University and the Problematic Grammars of Change in South Africa. These are the questions he posed. How can we discourse about decolonizing social sciences and humanities as, at this moment when the very political economy of the life of students is at stake? And he was making reference to the 2015 uh, Fees Must Fall, Roads Must Fall student protests. And it's just interesting how this continues to be appropriate and these questions continue to confront us now in relation to the pandemic. And of course, uh, Clint made the point in our discussion is that, you know, what we see is nothing new. How can, and another question he asked is, how can we focus on disciplinary debates at times when the reality facing us summons us to focus on questions of life and death as we are doing now? Can't we postpone the disciplinary debates for another moment and focus on the urgent questions of national crisis, crisis facing us? And I think in South Africa, we have a sense that we have been in and continue to be in this prolonged space of crises. In his lecture, he focused on key, uh, four key interrelated issues, ongoing student struggles, right? And I have to read this one quote that he uh, drew on from the placards, the, protest placards. We're not calling for a free university, but a free society. A free university within a capitalist society is much like having a lecture hall inside a, pr a prison. Trevor, you'll identify with that coming from a strong Marxist background. The idea of the university questioning why the idea of the university has become so, sorry, the second thing that he focused on was the idea of the university questioning why the idea of the university has become so highly contested. The third point, third thing that he focused on was the very grammars of change. 
Um, and that is the main discourse or language of transformation that characterizes South African higher education. And here, a key point he makes in relation to the grammars of change, which he refers to, are these transformation, Africanization, indigenization, diversification, and decolonization. He ended the lecture with four actions, which he suggested we must take seriously, particularly as forces for change, namely return to the base, rethinking thinking itself, shifting the geography and biography of knowledge, in other words, moving the center, and learning to unlearn in order to relearn. So that's my introduction, and I now would like to hand over to Clint. Thanks, Sarge, and uh, thanks um, to the Center for Civil Society, Shona and the team, and thanks everyone for, for joining us. We agreed uh, when we uh, were preparing uh, for this uh, dialogue that we wanted to say something about ourselves, but I think uh, uh, given the, the limited time we have, uh, we should uh, just take it for granted that we are participating in this dialogue as, as three colleagues who um, affirm our identity as activist scholars, as activist intellectuals, and what that means. Uh, we, uh, we, we give um, importance to contextuality, to criticality, to, to subjectivity, um, participation, praxis, and all the things that go along uh, with that. And if that's something we want to pick up in the discussion, we'll be able to, to, to do that. But as we uh, build on what Sarge has just said in the opening remarks, um, I want us to um, focus our attention on actual experiences um, right at the outset to begin this dialogue. So we're in this current context where there's capitalism, where there's a global pandemic, where there's racism, where, where, where there's um, uh, uh, forms of coloniality. Uh, there, there's just so much happening in our context. And as activist uh, scholars, we are not detached from what is happening around us. And so we want to engage in a conversation with one another and with the broader group that involves a critical reflection on historical praxis to use uh, Gustavo Gutierrez's um, uh, notion. So let's begin with what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have felt, what we have experienced, what we have discerned, what we have observed in terms of how the university and how the humanities are responding to our context, how they have been responding and how we have been responding to the context and how we continue to respond to this context with its crises, with its uh, global pandemic, with all its challenges and the various questions and feelings that uh, get evoked. So in other words, let's begin by placing the university and the humanities uh, different ways of acting and of practicing under the microscope and share our experiences of what we see. Um, and here we can think of, when we talk about the practices and the responses of the university to its context, um, the, its immediate context, its broader context, its different context, we think about the way decisions are made and the kinds of decisions are made. We think of uh, how processes take place within and through the university. We think of initiatives and campaigns. We think of operations. We think of administration. We think of ways of being, of relating. We think of ways of working together. We think of uh, different ways of collegiality, forms of collegiality. We think of ways of researching, ways of teaching and learning, ways of community engagement. We also think of ways of management. And we also think of ways of knowledge production and knowledge dissemination. And what is it that we see, feel, and hear? That's our starting question. Um, and so uh, perhaps Fekile, uh, we, you can get us started in terms of uh, reflecting on that question. What, what is it that you have seen from, from where you are 
and, and Sarge and myself will also add to that. Uh, Fikile, you are either there but on mute, um, but if you're not there, um, maybe Sarge, you could, um, you could get us started with that question. What is it that we are seeing in terms of the university's responses to our contexts? You know, I think <clears throat> as a feminist decolonial activist scholar, I'm very uh, cognizant of the dominant westernized masculine ways of knowing in my university, a university in Africa, right? And what really concerns me is that the, the, the presence of Eurocentric linguistically, and I like this quote by Bell Hooks, she talks about how the university reflects Eurocentricism um, and way, a white male uh, uh, domination. In that respect, I mean, I think about the neoliberal corporate university and I think about the ways in which I've experienced the implantation of new managerial practices in the corporate university, the commodification of knowledge um, and, and you know, the increased bureaucratization, uh, autocracy and authoritarianism in place of collegiality, competition and sexism and racism that I have personally experienced. And I think about these in relation to the pandemic and how the pandemic began to really uh, reveal or heighten our awareness of gross inequalities and inequities we experience both within higher education as well as broadly in our society. And at the outset of, uh, you know, the pandemic and responses from universities, what really alarmed me was the absence of dialogue and consultation with the very people that were being affected in all kinds of you know, extreme ways, particularly our students and our staff by the pandemic and this whole shift to online, so-called online teaching. And of course that needs to be further interrogated. So that was one of the things that really struck me as you know, significantly absent. And that highlighted the ways in which the university has been and continues to be anti-dialogic. Mm. I think I'll, I'll definitely build on on uh, I'll definitely build on that, Sarge. You know, this was something that was that that also was glaring for me the the anti-dialogical um, engagement um, or the absence of anti uh, the absence of dialogical engagement once again doing on Paulo Freire's work. Uh, and, and we saw that banking model in place where, where decisions uh, were just imposed on us as uh, academics, uh, just imposed on students, imposed on the institution, imposed on colleges and on schools. And um, uh, with, without, without a meaningful conversation, but also um, where attempts, certainly in terms of what I have experienced, uh, where attempts have been made to actually um, find ways of dialoguing, of, of questioning things uh, for the sake of, of, of trying to make a positive contribution. There wasn't place for that. Uh, 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 there was silencing, uh, there was exclusion, and there was this imposition. Uh, and, I, and I saw this particularly in the teaching and learning domain of the university's ways of, of relating uh, to its context. I also saw uh, what I'd call a hierarchy of values um, at work within the university where um, the, the institution and our disciplines and our schools, our colleges, including the humanities, there's a certain hierarchy of values that, uh, that, that we see. There, there was this contestation of values uh, in terms of what is really primary for for you, as opposed to me, so for the uh, for the institution itself, it was all about the value of saving the academic year at any cost, at all costs. There's no room for dialogue. There's no room for doing anything differently. And then at the same time, there's the value of 
of um, recognizing the existential uh, and economic realities uh, of students, their lived experiences. Um, and so how though that hierarchy of values was what was there. And maybe lastly, I'll just say uh, another observation I made was in the ways of researching as a university. I saw examples of academics rushing to um, put out a call for papers, to have a special edition of uh, whatever discipline wanting to respond to COVID-19 or global pandemic. This is, this is just as we're getting started with the lockdown. This is as we're just trying to kind of find ourselves. You know, we don't even know how to use a Zoom. Uh, our Zoom call works, but we are wanting to uh, produce knowledge uh, that can impact in terms of how we respond to the pandemic. And I just think that says a lot about the mode and the methodology that we are working with as scholars. And it says a lot about the university uh, and something that needed to be interrogated. So that uh, that was um, not uh, good experiences that, that I had. Um, Fakile, uh, are you there now to tell us what you saw, heard or felt? Yes, uh, I'm here. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm sorry, I'm having problem with network. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you so much. I just wanted to speak really from the place of dialogical scholarship, which is which is something that I also observed during COVID-19 in the manner that we were responding as various institutions and how it relates to activist scholarship and how all of that is really centered around, around who we are when we are talking about the project of decolonization. And, and what, what my observation was is that it became very clear at some point in the journey, particularly during the pandemic, as all of us were saying, let's migrate to online learning, um, that there is something that we are not being conscious of. And that particular thing is our lived realities, centering the human, um, our human selves in our pedagogical approaches, in our, in our scholarship generally, particularly during the pandemic. Whereas the pandemic itself, it continues to, 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 to be that kind of work that sends us back to our conscience as spaces of learning and spaces of teaching. And that conscience then says, the manner in which we teach, we learn, we need to be able to center the human. And the human is that fundamental component of what it means to be Abandu. It is embedded in the philosophical ways of Ubuntu. When we speak about Umundu, Umundu, Abandu, which is really one of those um, Praxis, not even just a philosophical approach, but a way of being, a way of life that says, I cannot be if you are not. So how does that look like in an institution or an environment of learning and teaching? It means that we cannot push for ways of teaching and learning that neglect human experiences. And during COVID-19, those realities meant that we cannot continue to teach without being mindful and being, being aware about the fact that both those who are being taught and those who are, who are teaching uh, as teaching workers and learners are actually engaged in an experience of hunger, an experience of starvation, an experience of inequity, just in terms of even migrating to online because immediately COVID-19 set all of us back to what was called home home being different for all of us. We know this, the, the, the demographics of South Africa. It meant that many of us were going back to informal settlements. Many of us were going back to townships. And these are highly embedded um, and equal spaces in our society because of the, of the colonization amongst other forms of violences of the past. And, and the silencing of that experience in the manner that we're responding and responded as 
you know, spaces of learning and teaching is something that was troubling. And that is what for me is something that we really need to be conscious of that when we talk about a project of decolonization, I don't know if you can still hear me, we are talking about a project of conscience, a project that returns us to who we are. And I will stop there, but that is really from, um, you know, one of the things I observed, I have so much to say, but I will, I will open up for my colleagues as well to speak. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, in, in, in the, the, the dialogue uh, of the broader group, which we want to get to as soon as possible, uh, there might be also it could be experiences uh, that others can share, you know, in terms of how the university relates to uh, our, our context. But what we just did in a nutshell there was what Paulo Freire was talking about when he, when he spoke about naming and, 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 and doing that social analysis, reflecting on what is going on. Um, and, and so in the light of those experiences, we also now need to move from naming to reflecting, um, this critical reflection that's needed. We need to somehow make sense of what is going on. We need to make a sense of why what is going on is, is going on. And, and, and so as, as activist scholars, um, we are interested um, in a resistance against dehumanization because the various examples that we have shared and could share uh, will, will, a common thread that we will see there is that there's something of dehumanization going on there. There's this deconstitution, uh, constituting going on there, this destitutedness that's going on there um, instead of the rehumanization that uh, someone like uh, Freire would, would, would talk about. And so conscientization is needed. But um, in order for this conscientization uh, process to, to take root, we, we then have to ask critical questions about our social reality. So we have to ask questions like to what extent, if any, is the university and the humanities a school for dehumanization? Um, whose interests are being served? whose interests are being protected, whose values are being privileged, privileged whose methods are, uh, are regarded as normative and authoritative, who is being included and excluded in the work that we do as institutions um, uh, and humanities, uh, uh, who gets rewarded and affirmed as opposed to others who get disciplined and stigmatized, uh, who gets centered and marginalized uh, as opposed to those who get uh, silenced? You know, is the institution, is the academy perpetuating the status quo in our context? Uh, or is it isolating itself from the status quo, status quo, pretending to be neutral, which is actually another way of preserving the status quo? Or is the university resisting and reimagining uh, our life together? And so this. Uh, responsibility of, of naming that um, uh, Freire talks about uh, leads us to this the, the, the reflection. Given our experiences, uh, what really is going on? What, what underlies all of these um, aspects that we have experienced? Is there a common thread? Is there an underlying structure? Is there a, a, a logic, an internal logic? Uh, is there a convening rationale? that helps us make sense of and interpret and critique the practices of the university and humanities as a site of struggle, of contestation, and maybe even perhaps of hope. So uh, what, what do we think? Um, maybe Sarge, what, what's the answer for you? What, what, what is underlying, what is underlying all of this stuff that we are talking about? I have a question for you and for Fikile based on what yeah. you've said, right? And it extends the questioning that you have just posed to everybody. You talked about the hierarchy of values and you, you talked about it in relation to the pandemic and the responses of universities across the country and I think globally as well. How does this reflect, you know, the, the very nature of universities in terms of governance, institutional culture, decision making, etc. And how does that begin to perpetuate coloniality within the university and, for example, within the humanities, right? So that's my question for you. And in relation, uh, sorry, and Fikile, to you, 
in relation to your uh, uh, positioning as an activist scholar, during the pandemic, I'm aware of how, you know, the, the extent to which you immersed yourself in your activism um, around various things in terms of food and well being in communities around you, in terms of gender based violence, in terms of, you know, a whole range of issues. Student, uh, uh, I mean, there were so many things happening around us. How did your experiences working in communities and with communities in terms of your activism influence your approach to the shift to online teaching and what that meant for us? And how does that then begin to reflect the very nature of how the university is structured and how uh, um, faculties like, uh, and how the humanities, for example, are structured? Uh, and I also see that Jane, who is a colleague, has an interesting comment and question. And once we open up, I'm hoping, Jane, you will engage with the question that you have posed to us, and we will collectively engage with that. Yeah, for me, Sarge, um, I, th I think one of the things I would say is um, that, that underlying all of this, you know, where that I've tried to make sense of it is uh, to, to draw on uh, the, the, the work we are doing through the Decoloniality Action uh, Forum um, and, and coloniality um, uh, with its matrix of, 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 of power, uh, uh, um, of being, um, of knowledge um, and how all of those things happen um, uh, helps me make sense. Um, so, you know, we can think of colonialism as having to do with different processes and strategies and projects that took, a pla took place. But when we talk about coloniality, we actually recognize that there are, there's a pattern. There's a pattern of power. Uh, there's, a, there's a pattern of, of a dehumanizing way of relating, of, of, of silencing, of invalidating, of discriminating, um, of, of being violent that goes beyond um, the end of uh, the colonial project, so to speak, or colon uh, colonialism. Um, it continues uh, and, and it reproduces itself, it repeats itself in different ways. And I think this is the context uh, we are in in South Africa, and this is the context we're in as a university where we see that indeed uh, uh, um, coloniality uh, is not over, it's, it's all over. Um, uh, we, we can make connections, for instance, with how the university, uh, along with many other universities have become a corporate university. You know, we get emails that tell us uh, to submit things at a certain deadline by COB tomorrow, you know, by close of business. The language has changed, the rhetoric has changed. Um, and therefore students become clients and in the, in the negative sense, clients uh, in the sense of, of being these customers, we, we've got to recruit them, we've got to get them into the system and we've got to get them out of the system. Um, even though good research takes time, um, but we, we, we rush people through processes, even as academics, you know, uh, in terms of how we manage our time, uh, we have this uh, uh, reality of time poverty. Uh, time is, a, is, a, is commodified, it's a scarce resource. And so we've got to account and we've got to fill in templates for everything we do and how we spend our time. And even though we spend 60% of our time in community engagement uh, with, with intentions of responsible impact as academic, uh, uh, activist uh, scholars, um, we, we have um, formulas that say, um, you know, if, if you are um, accounting for your time spent in communities, in community engagement, it's a maximum of 10%. So it doesn't matter if it was 70%, it's a maximum of 10%. Therefore, you were irresponsible with your time. And so uh, there's a lot of examples I can give, but I see the, uh, how coloniality in its different forms is being um, is continuing and being reproduced and modeled and getting stronger and stronger and it's been justified, fortified, um, and uh, and 
and advanced. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Sarge and Clint. I think for me, you know, in the work that I continue to do during COVID, in, in, you know, in terms of activist scholarship, what, what I've seen and what I continue to see is how a new liberal university is deepening itself, how a capitalist university is deepening itself in a sense that in the very same experiences of inequity, deepening sense of inequalities, there is no value for what we call even community engagement, which is at the center of investing in the very form of what it's, it means to be human. You know, things like food, things like our health, we're living through a pandemic, you know, but there was no prioritization of safety of those who are learning or even those who are teaching, you know, um, in, 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 in various ways. And, and I'm talking about safety here, human safety, not just COVID-19 safety, food security, because when we talk about security and safety, we talk about the security of the human. And that is, a, that is embedded in what happened post-1945, you know, when, when neoliberal agendas were inserted in our states um, post-independence. It's the agenda of independence that said that you cannot, you dare not invest in communities. You dare not invest in any work in any form that rebuilds the social fabric of what it means to be human and, and what it means to be a community. So, so for me, um, that is what has happened. Uh, I apologize for the noise because I'm trying to find a network space that is quiet. So that is what has happened and that is what is perpetuated. And, and also, I mean, I won't even add the things that Clint has spoken about. There was so much that we have neglected and that we continue to neglect, which is the human in this project called education. And I would like to invoke Paula Freire here who says that an education system that does not prioritize dialogue with those who are in the system of education, it is nothing else but a system that is imposing itself. It is a system that is imposing itself and therefore it is a violent system. It is a system of education that is oppressive. And he speaks about this in the pedagogy of the oppressed. And that is what I've seen. I've seen how this project of education during COVID-19 has been nothing else but the deepening of oppressive experiences of the new liberal project, of the capitalist project, which we all know, of course, is a project of coloniality. So, so that, that, is, that is the essence. I, I wonder if, if I may, uh, if I may um, maybe just to, to also help uh, draw in uh, the larger group into our discussion is in terms of moving forward, so to speak, you know, we, we, we started out very critically about putting the, the, the university, the humanities, the practices, uh, the ways of being, ways of relating, ways of working, all of these things under the, uh, the spotlight, under the microscope. And, and we experience different things and we are reflecting critically on it. Um, and and we, we, we're trying to understand what underlies it um, so in terms of, of moving ahead, um, there's this task uh, for the decolonial, decolonial, decoloniality project that uh, Mignolo uh, refers to drawing on a comment his student made uh, about uh, the project as the reconstitution uh, of the destituted or the reconstitution of the deconstituted. So, I think the, the, the challenge uh, in terms of further reflection is what, 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 do, what does that really mean and, and what implications does it have for how we practice what we do um, as a university, as humanities? Um, is our university and the humanities an instrument for the ongoing uh, uh, coloniality that we experience? 
uh, or might it be an instrument for advancing uh, the decoloniality uh, project uh, that involves the reconstitution of the of the destituted. Um, and that's what uh, Freire is talking about when he talks about acting, um, how, how might we respond um, in terms of moving forward and decolonizing the humanities. So I don't know if any of our colleagues or we can open it up to the broader group at, at this stage. Uh, Tim, there are some comments and questions, and perhaps uh, Danford, I don't know if you want to facilitate that. Yes, um, I can. I, yes, okay. I can and that read out the question. Dialogue. Yes, some of them are, are comments. They are, uh, they are very long. I'll just try to summarize them. Actually, uh, a... sorry, Danford, can I just interrupt yes. quickly? Perhaps we get yes. the, the participants to read their questions and comments. Oh, okay. I think that would be better because it opens up the dialogue. Apologies for that. Yes, uh, that's, that's empowerment. We need to give uh, power back to the people. Yes. So I will start with uh, Jane, if you can read out your, your comment and question. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, okay, so I've posted two rather long things, but I'll just read them quickly because, um, as you might be able to see if you've read them, they are about looking for seriously practical responses. So I'm interested in the structural mechanisms being used to reinforce the prevailing lack of dialogue between academic workers and students within the pres present shattered university learning communities under the suffocating COVID blanket hollowing out our campuses. I think means of dialogue is a critical practical task to be challenged by all of us to counteract the current alienation and vulnerability. Again, I added this, sorry, I'm looking for the structural means to promote radically democratic dialogue for the possibility of liberating education relationships. Um, and, and I suppose that that's my wording for saying by radical democratic dialogue, I'm looking at how we make the broadest ownership, um, equitable, just ownership of dialogue um, in the way in which we make our world. Um, so just linking it to what I said later on is that two things. The very first notice that UKZN put out about this COVID closure and picking up on where we this um, current dialogue started today about the lack of dialogue from management is that the, that the notice from management had a critical footnote. It was about avoiding protests at all costs. And we were at that time still in the protest process of deregistration protests. Um, and the, it was a, such a heavy handed, clever, if we can call it that, move of management to simply roll us up and silently send us all away, sort of into atomized um, ways of, of not having uh, a collective voice and space to talk back. And, and it's that lack of collective space for a collective voice that I'm very concerned about. It's, it's, so spaces like you've created here are great, but of course it's, not a um, it, it's just, I, I, I kind of, we have students right here. I live close to university, fortunately for me, but I know where students are. And, and in our classes, it's coming up the fact that people are panicking. They're supposed to be concentrating on end of the year, um, getting in assessments, and yet NSFAS is gonna run out and, and they're gonna be stuck on campus without food or at home without food. And so the whole point of us actually trying to carry on checking that everybody's there in class and doing a, an assignment and whatever becomes pointless unless that assignment is actually how are we going to make sure that everybody is eating so that they can all be part of this conversation? And, and of course, that sounds like a very radical thing to say, but it's, but it's the urgency that I feel because I don't generally have a way to say to my colleagues, how are we doing this? How are we speaking back to this absolute overwhelm of people trying to teach the students and support the students and the students themselves? So, thanks.
Thank you, Jane. If we can take uh, a comment from Amanda, and then Sarge, you can respond to, to Jane's contribution. Amanda? Greetings, everyone. Thank you all, and thank you, Dr. Clint, for your team and your team for this opportunity um, to speak about decoloniality. At this moment, by the way, um, uh, Clint and I, beautiful difference, uh, gift and virtue BDS toolkit, which speaks a lot about the actually discrimination in the Israeli-Palestinian context. Um, our BDS Advent Kairos Global New Year to uh, talk at Africa's poorest of the poor in conjunction with Palestinians have just restorative hope, promises and expectations of a decoloniality reality at this movement. Difference, by the way, um, in God Allah Yahweh's creation. Jesus, Lord and King of the universe creation has come again, giving fullness of life for those oppressed who shall govern, who have had suffered centuries of generational poverty, institutional racism, colonized education, where humanities are inhumanities. They have ignored, ignored God's law and God's kingdom. Um, they have a slave been slaved human trafficking and extreme exploitation using toxic patriarchal and religious Zionism. This is written in our underground academy for lifelong learning, NaNoWriMo books of life experiences with Palestinian writers. We are the, I think Linda said, the, re, the reconstitution of the destitute. Um, as has been referenced by Paolo Ferreira, critically evaluating in his pedagogy pedagogy of uh, in indignation, the empowerment of the poorest voices who demand the purpose of education. What is it for and who is it for? It's not to serve the capitalist, the colonist, or the empire. Education is to be a dialogical Afrocentric engagement where Afrocentric values are Afrocentric centric vision for Afrocentric practices and Afrocentric fullness of life reality. These are the kingdom of God's laws for the kingdom of God's people that overcome the toxic racist laws of oppression and abuse, particularly during the 16 days now and every day of activism against gender-based violence, human trafficking, life denying toxic religious Zionism, silencing and exploitation. The poorest of the poor are fully empowered and fully participatory for dialogical engagement. And this has to be the reality. Thank you. If we can have, if, if we can have, yeah, sorry, Danford. Yeah. I was saying if we can have uh, uh, the panel respond to some of the comments and questions raised. Or we can open up to other people in the, in, in yeah. the to respond to the questions and comments that have been made thus far. And I, I like Jane's question because at the end of the day, um, some of us here, Jane, Clint, Lubna, myself, um, Fatima and maybe others here, we're part of a little collective that came together at the beginning of COVID to engage with how universities were responding to the pandemic, right? And what was happening. And we realized that it was really important for us to create a critical mass to engage with how universities, well, the university management, um, and I'm not gonna use the word leaders because I didn't think that they were leading us. They were managing uh, uh, the crisis and, the university in the crisis. We came together and we developed what we called um, an approach to addressing how the, you know, how the pandemic had uh, you know, situated us 
in higher education. And we called it a social pedagogy, right? Um, just to give you a quick example, we had a, a university-wide meeting with our VC. And I raised the question of whether the university would be interested in engaging with that document and the proposal in that document for a social pedagogy, which would take us forward during this time of COVID. Clint has already spoken about the, you know, um, the, the, the key uh, goal of university management across universities in South Africa was about saving the academic year. And we need to think about how that relates to economics, right? But to get back to Jane's question, at the end of the day, when I asked that question, the VC responded by saying, yes, we've looked at the document and that was the end of the discussion. So at the end of the day, we look at how new managerialism and these uh, practices from corp the corporate sector have been uh, implemented within the university, which then closes off, and you, Clint has spoken about that, closes off dialogue, closes and silences us as students and staff. And at the end of the day, we've all experienced, I mean, I think those of us that uh, at UKZN, Jane, Clint, Lubna, myself, Figile, we've experienced where you challenge the status quo, where you challenge things or you raise things or you resist or you question, and then we begin to experience very negative consequences as a result of that. So um, yeah, I'll stop there and I think, let's hear what other people have to say. Maybe let, let me just take uh, another comment from, from Lubna. Lubna, if you want to contribute and also from Betty. Hi everyone, thank you so much. Um, so thank you colleagues and comrades for the input and the conversation. Uh, for me, for the last nine or 10 months that we've been through this COVID experience, uh, it just brought into sharp focus the ongoing domination of colonial discourse and practice and without any real effort to dismantle or disrupt it, except from uh, activists and activist scholars. And I felt that even efforts to Africanize our curriculum, because that's the big buzzword, or, or introduce African ways of teaching um, have become a colonial process because it's sort of all bureaucratized mm -hmm. and it's not organic uh, or, or, you know, it's, it's not um, hum humane or humanistic. It's, it's really all bureaucratic. And for me, what I think we need is to really reimagine the academy um, and, and, and perhaps disrupt the way in which it actually is constituted and reimagine the university and the concept of a, a higher education in general. Um, and I'm not sure how we would do that, but I think that that is the direction which, in which we really need to go through because or go towards, because I think that would help us to um, move towards rethinking uh, this sort of project that we're all part of and really then decolonize um, you know, higher education. So thank you so much for the opportunity to input on that. Thank you, Lupna. It seems as if Betty, uh, she has left uh, the webinar. If we can have uh, maybe two more contributions before we, we close the session from, from the participants. Well, while people are thinking, if I may, um, just to build on what, what has been said uh, and also with reference to what Jane was, was saying. Um, two things, uh, you know, one of the things Jane is always um, emphasizing uh, as I've journeyed with her uh, through these different struggles uh, from fees must fall to, to all kinds of uh, issues is the the, the value of solidarity, I think that that, that must be part of this uh, decoloniality action forum, you know, that we need solidarity with one another as well, because we, 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 we pay a price and it's not about uh, trying to put ourselves out there as these martyrs, but to say that um, 
when 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 you're tampering with 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 structures of power, uh, when you're tampering with a coloniality project, um, you are going to it's not going to end well. Um, there's going to be violence. There's going to be silencing. There's going to be alienation, isolation, and and all of us uh, who've been in those spaces uh, uh, can, can talk. There will be I, I, I hate this term, but uh, just for the dramatic effect, so to speak, um, uh, this professional suicide that you open yourself up to as well. And I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an opportunity for us to also reflect uh, also more humanly and relationally uh, in our ways of working together uh, in this uh, uh, project and, and, and stand uh, with us. Um, you know, I, I always say when, um, during Fees Must Fall, when, when Jane and I got arrested, um, not one of my colleagues actually checked up on me. I don't know about Jane, but uh, not, not, not one person checked up or had a conversation with me. How am I doing? Um, and all of that, not that the focus needed to, to, to be on me uh, as such. Um, and then more recently, you know, I, I proposed an initiative, a space of dialogue where colleagues could come together and we could reflect on what it means to be an academic in a corporate context and how we relate to time. So it was a nice, you know, civil, um, liberal kind of uh, approach um, to getting people to, to, to talk. Not one colleague showed up. I, I, I ended up uh, using it as an opportunity to, 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 to video myself so that I have a webinar I can share with, with people. So there's something about solidarity that we've got to take uh, very seriously because we, we, we need to be um, collective. Um, it's not an individualistic project because then we are just reinforcing uh, the, 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 the forms of, of, of coloniality. The other thing to say is the document and the process that um, Sarge referred to, um, there's a document of public universities with a public conscience. If you Google that, or if you contact us, we can send it to you where we talk about the social pedagogy. Uh, but one of the papers, the reflections and papers that came out of that process also, was also trying to um, uh, make sense of where we as, as, as academics um, locate ourselves. And Jane is always talking about proximity and, and so on. And, and there were these three positions that came out of this reflection. The first position was, was what was called a liberal approach. This is where uh, as, as academics in terms of uh, academics and institutions, uh, in terms of responding to our context, we, 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 we respond by, by simply attempting to implement the status quo without challenging social structures. And that's very clear, we see that. Um, the second uh, approach was what was called the progressive approach. This is when you respond to the context or to the pandemic by challenging the status quo and social structures. But it's a more, it's a more sympathetic kind of uh, 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 approach and it's appreciated. But then there's the third approach, and I think this is also what we and Jane and others try to talk about, a more radical approach, where you respond to the context and the pandemic through reimagining social structures beyond the current crisis. And I think that that was helpful uh, in terms of, of helping us understand where we are locating ourselves and, 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 and to what extent, if any, is that responsive to uh, the decoloniality project in terms of the reconstitution of the destituted or the deconstituted. Um, it matters where we stand. Uh, it matters that we are biased. It matters that we have an agenda. But the decoloniality project, uh, as Walter Mignolo uh, says, um, it's not a mission of trying to convert everybody to, 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 to join the club, um, it's an option. And so it's an option that we present in and through the Decoloniality Action Forum and, and through all the other uh, collectives that exist around the world um, and throughout the country. Um, yeah, 
um, that's a challenge before us. Thank you, Clint. Uh, I'll take a contribution from Felipe. And then I will have a closing remarks from the panelists and also from Shona, because we are running out of time now. Felipe, our Brazilian yes. comrade. Yes. Yeah, hello to everyone. I was, uh, I was just writing uh, my contribution in the, in the chat. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm sorry that I came uh, uh, a bit late. I was in another uh, uh, professional meeting. Uh, but uh, my, my contribution, I, I share well, already what I wrote in the chat. It's, um, it's just to say that I understand that we are living a, a, a new phase of a regime of decoloniality during this, this pandemic. And I, I wrote two aspects here that I'm gonna read to, to make it shorter and, and, and just mention a third aspect that could contribute to our advancing in reflecting uh, decoloniality in these times. The first one, I think we are facing a, a change in this regime of coloniality in the time of pandemic. It is related with the advancing of capitalism in what is called, I don't know if you also use this expression in South Africa, the new normal. The new normal requires resources and internet inclusion. It means exclusion for those without adequate means and an increase in inequality because of uh, radically different conditions of access to the means of participation in the so-called new normal uh, life. Um, the second one, this new normal, what, what I'm trying to call pandemic coloniality, increases also demand of work, uh, taking over the private uh, uh, sphere, the private dimension of our life for the use of, of work. So capitalism <clears throat> is, advancing even more into our homes, using our personal resources in our free time without uh, remunerating uh, accordingly to, to the demand, the, the, the increased demand of work and, uh, and not refunding the personal investment of workers uh, to acquire what, what means uh, and what requires uh, to be up for this new challenges of this new uh, normal. And it also obviously uh, uh, requires or, or means reduction of rights and uh, by, uh, by the justification that uh, uh, at this time uh, we are living in a, a financial crisis. So increasing demand of work for, for especially and now considering the education workers mm -hmm but also uh, uh, those who are involved in the uh, academic and, and intellectual uh, uh, task. And the third one will be more related with uh, uh, politics, uh, considering that the pandemic uh, is creating a, a, a pandemic state of exception. So to say, uh, in Brazil, you must know uh, in, in other places of the world, we are uh, observing a, a growing type of fascist uh, uh, society, not only in, in government, but also in the, the narratives and, and discourse of, of people. And this, uh, in times of pandemic, uh, uh, is also justifying the, the violence of state and uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the increase of a kind of state of vigilance uh, that takes over our lives. So I think in, in, in this kind of political atmosphere, we should uh, take even more attention to, to racism and violence in a, in a racist uh, perspective. We just got in Brazil uh, a case of a black man, another one, 
dead in a shop, suffocated by uh, by security guards, uh, and this is happening all over, and violence in 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 a racist uh, dimension, and also gender. Uh, I think we the women are are, are those who are having their their rights and the private life more uh, took over by this uh, uh, kind of political atmosphere. So this uh, fascist new pandemic uh, state of exception is uh, pushing back uh, the whole progressive agenda that we were managing to, to build slowly uh, in the last few years. I, I think this is a the last aspect. Sorry if I, I went too long, but just to share some of my 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 worries and, and considerations with you. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Felipe. If I can get a contribution, just a minute from Nompumelelo. Uh, I see you've written something here. Nompumelelo Tavete. Yes, uh, yes, I'm um, not. Thank yes. you so much. Just Thanks. one minute. Uh, I had to recognize you and then we'll, we'll give it to Shona and the panelists to, you know, to, to wrap up the. No, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Shona for the seminar and all the speakers. Very insightful. Uh, wonderful always to listen to Plinz, a wonderful friend and mentor. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much. I'm not going to repeat what I've already said in the chat, but I, I think I was just reiterating uh, Lupna's points to say, you know, the struggle is real and the struggle moves beyond our borders. So we must really look at the higher education sector as a system, a system that needs to be questioned. So if we're talking of questioning the status quo, uh, we must be looking at the entire system because if you only restricting the struggle to UKZN, you know, without knowing, sometimes you disadvantage our students. We have actually seen that in some of the areas um, of their education. Thank you so much. Thanks again for organizing this seminar. Thank you so much, Dompu uh, I'll, I'll now give uh, uh, the floor to, uh, to Shona and to the panelists uh, to give us uh, the concluding remarks. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dan. I don't, I don't really want to add anything because we are well over time, but just to thank the speakers and thank everyone for participating and also just to acknowledge how um, this was a nice departure from the way that things are usually done. I loved the way that we began um, by paying allegiance to our own context. Um, I also appreciate the, that we were talking about this idea of dialoguing and that this webinar, I don't even think we should call it a webinar, this dialogue was actually that dialogue format. So I think that um, it's, this has been a really great experience in terms of um, webinar dialogue and how to do things um, in different ways. Um, and in ways that maybe name and question normatives that we usually follow. So that's all I want to say and just thank you. But I, I wonder if um, the speakers wanted to end and say anything and so perhaps give them the opportunity to do that. But just to say thanks to everyone for participating. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Andres. From, from my side, um, just to say thank you very much. I, I don't think we'll add anything uh, from our side uh, because of time, but um, I think there's a lot of food for thought from the questions and comments that everyone raised. And it, it really is an ongoing conversation because coloniality continues. My final comment is, um, just to say again, thank you to CCS for setting up this 
dialogue and to say that we've initiated a dialogue and we hope that there will be ways in which we can take this dialogue forward. Uh, I think these are critical dialogues that we need to have in terms of engaging with what, uh, what the university is all about, the modern Western patriarchal neoliberal corporate university. And I think the responsibility is ours, not to just engage, but to begin to resist this and work towards transformation, real transformation, not the neoliberal kind. Thank you so much all. I, hi, um, thank you so much. I think my last comments would be to say that I think it's very important um, that the work of decolonizing our scholarship really takes us back to reconstituting the destituted and, and these are our communities and our homes. And we need the kind of scholarship that doesn't just produce exploited workers for the capitalist system, but we need to reorganize our society. We need to reorganize and reverse the violences of coloniality in reality in through our scholarship and that for me is really what is important and it is that work of bringing the margins to the center of learning and teaching well thank you everyone for attending um I think uh, we we have to conclude this webinar. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I don't know, Shona, if you've got the last, last words you, that you want to say. Nope, just bye, everyone, and keep safe. <laughs> OK. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Sarge. Bye, Clint. Thanks, Fikile. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.